Hi everyone, my name is Kate Silver. Um, I am an adult and pediatric uh, rheumatologist at MUSC, uh, the Medical University in Charleston, South Carolina. And today I will be talking to y'all about um, advocating for your child. So your child has been diagnosed with scleroderma. Now what, where do we go from here? And I've been told that all questions should be held till the end. Okay, and these are my disclosures. So our objectives for today um, really are to educate parents and caregivers on pediatric scleroderma. And to do that, we first need to understand the two major types of pediatric scleroderma, localized scleroderma or morphia, as you may hear me call it, and systemic sclerosis. Uh, we'll discuss the appropriate testing for each of these, for localized scleroderma and for systemic sclerosis, and then how to interpret the results, and then we will briefly uh, review the recommended treatments for these. Okay, so the goals for today, I hope that you leave with the knowledge you need to advocate for your child, uh, so that you, when you go with them to the doctor, you know what to expect and how to respond. Um, and as you can see from the cartoon here, Calvin's dad says, oh, it's all in the book you get when you become a father. If only it were that easy, right? <laughs> so, um, so the topic today is uh, to how to advocate for your child. So first let's examine this word, to advocate, to support or argue for a cause, uh, to plead in favor of, to act as an advocate for someone or something. And I just put a few synonyms on here, uh, to advise, to urge, and support. And the, I like the last one the best, probably, to champion. And I think uh, it's fair to say that as parents, we do this for our children regardless, almost uh, you know, day in and day out. We all advocate for our children. Uh, however, when you throw a diagnosis of scleroderma into the mix, it presents a whole nother unique set of challenges in how to advocate for your child. So the scleroderma disorders are a group of conditions that are characterized by the presence of thickened skin or sclerotic skin lesions. Um, that's the similarity. Really, the other manifestations can be quite diverse. Uh, and this is a key point that's often overlooked by a lot in the um, a lot of people in healthcare uh, who don't have a lot of experience with this disease. Uh, so the easiest way to classify scleroderma is to to divide it into localized scleroderma or morphia uh, versus uh, the systemic form of the disease. So that's what we're, where we will start. Okay. Um, so the first uh, step in advocating for your child certainly is to make sure that you have the right diagnosis, okay? So it is important to distinguish whether your child has localized scleroderma or morphia versus the st systemic sclerosis, because even though these are classified in the same group of scleroderma diseases, they really are, I, I see them as, as very different. Um, as far as their manifestations, how these can affect your child, and also how we approach treatment. So, um, and I think some of the other speakers at the conference have sort of delved into this, so I won't spend too much time on it today, um, but localized scleroderma or morphia, there are several different um, subtypes of this, including linear scleroderma, which oftentimes can affect a limb, an arm, or a leg, and then another specific type, oncudisabra, which can affect the face. Um, circumscribed or plaque morphia, generalized morphia, pansclerotic morphia, and mixed morphia. Uh, and then moving over into systemic sclerosis, uh, these are divided into, are classified as diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis and limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis and then overlap syndromes with number one and number three being more common in p the pediatric population. Okay, so this is kind of just a real quick slide on how to really distinguish because between localized scleroderma and systemic sclerosis because this is even hard for healthcare professionals. And again, everything and how you're going to advocate for your child depends on nailing down the correct diagnosis. Um, so typically with, um, with localized scleroderma or morphia, that's the column here, um, you are not gonna have Raynaud phenomenon, which is the color change of the fingers when they get cold, um, turning white or blue. 
Here's a picture of that right here. Um, you're not going to have, your child's not going to have puffy fingers. Um, as you can see, this is a picture of sort of some puffy fingers and what we call sclerodactyly, tightening of the skin over the fingers. You typically do not see that in the localized form of the disease. And then abnormal nail fold capillaries. So you can see in this picture, um, you can see sort of the red changes here to the base of the nail. And this is looking at it under a microscope. You will see those changes with a diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. You typically will not see those um, with, uh, with a diagnosis of localized scleroderma morphia. Okay, so we're gonna start with sort of the first half of the talk, focusing on localized scleroderma and running through that, and then we'll switch gears to the second half of the talk to talk about systemic sclerosis. So localized scleroderma or morphia principally involves the skin. Uh, however, deeper structures can be affected, including sort of the subcutaneous fat and tissues, muscles and bone, as you can see in this picture here, you can see atrophy of the, the underlying uh, fat and muscles. Um, typically, localized scleroderma, localized scleroderma lacks internal organ involvement. Um, and so the major problem uh, that children uh, and young adults with localized scleroderma face has to do with morbidity and not mortality. Um, and these can include growth defects, deformities, things of that nature. Uh, now, I did say that it principally involves the skin and typically does not uh, involve internal organs. However, one in four children with morphia will develop an extracutaneous manifestation, so something other than skin involvement. These, the most common of these really include arthritis. Um, you can have neurologic findings like headaches and seizures, um, and then ocular findings uh, such as uveitis, which is inflammation in the eye. So how do we go about diagnosing morphia or localized scleroderma? The first thing to know is that this is a clinical diagnosis. This is made based on your physical exam and physical exam findings. Um, so determined by the physical appearance of the lesions. A skin biopsy may be useful for confirmation if the diagnosis is in question. Um, the diagnosis is not dependent on blood work or lab testing. Okay, so this is a diagnosis that's made uh, by, uh, by the physician physical, on physical exam. Um, however, we do generally recommend some initial lab screening tests uh, with a first presentation. Um, these typically include uh, blood counts, inflammatory markers such as a sed rate and CRP, liver enzymes, muscle enzymes, and an ANA or an anti-nuclear antibody test. And this can actually be positive in up to 50% of uh, patients with morphia. So now once we get the labs, how do we go about interpreting those? Um, if you see elevation in <coughs> liver enzymes, uh, C or your muscle enzymes, your CK or your aldolase, this may be indicative of deeper structure involvement, particularly muscle involvement. Um, sometimes if the inflammatory markers are elevated, this can be useful because this can be something that is monitored during treatment to assess the response. So, you know, they may be elevated when your child first presents and then as treatment uh, begins to take effect, is, if those come down, that would be a positive response to treatment. Um, now, a rheumatoid factor is not always checked. I didn't include that in the initial screening laboratory workup. Uh, but if it is checked, it can be positive in up to one in four patients. And those are typically uh, the patients that will have an arthritis to go along with the morphia. So if, you're, um, if you think your child is having some joint pain or joint swelling or there is a concern for arthritis, it might be useful to make sure that the physician checks a rheumatoid factor if that wasn't initially done. Um, imaging, uh, such as x-rays, MRIs, CT scans, um, typically not necessary in, uh, in localized scleroderma or morphia, but certain cases an MRI can be indicated. Uh, so for facial involvement, such as in this young, um, young boy with Ankuda Sabra, you can see it affecting the face. 
Um, and this is his MRI, and you can actually see changes to the bone right here that correspond to his facial lesion, and even some more changes to actually the brain tissue. You can see it's not symmetric. There are actually some changes here um, that go along with his overlying skin lesion there. Um, Certainly, if um, there are any, your child's having any neurologic symptoms like headache or seizure or anything like that, you would want to get an MRI as well. Um, and then involvement of deeper, if involvement of deeper structures is suspected. So this is an MRI of a leg here, and you can see where it sort of lights up, where it's white. That shows um, in sort of involvement of the deeper structures like the fascia and the muscle, and here even a little bit in the knee joint. Okay, so now that the disease has been diagnosed, so we've established a diagnosis of morphia or localized scleroderma, how do we monitor it, okay? There are a few uh, clinical scoring measures, the localized scleroderma severity index and the localized scleroderma damage index, and these are easy to use, however, there are limitations to these. So these really kind of measure um, what the skin lesions look like, and so that can be very subjective and can vary from physician to physician. Um, so it's very hard to standardize it. Um, and additionally, this is, I think, the major drawback is that these both of these systems, scoring measures, combine features of disease activity with disease damage. So once the damage has occurred, we, can't, we can sort of no longer do anything about that, so we wanna focus on disease activity if you have a uh, scoring measure that combines both, I think that's less useful um, and sort of muddies the picture a little bit. And these really, neither of these have been validated in, in, in large cohorts of patients. Of course, that's very difficult because uh, this is a rare, uh, a rare uh, disease. Okay. Um, other ways to monitor uh, the disease are with non-invasive non -invasive imaging. Um, so you can do infrared thermography, you can do laser Doppler imaging, and high frequency ultrasound. So these pictures are of the infrared thermography, and you can see the morphia affecting the right arm here and how it is lights up red compared to the unaffected arm. And here's a case of Ancuda de Sabra affecting the face. And you can see this is shot looking up here. This is the affected side where it's more red. This is pre-treatment and this is post-treatment. You can see where the activity has sort of, has, has resolved with treatment. Um, these are very pretty pictures. Uh, I can't say we use these a lot clinically. There's limited availability. Um, I can at least speak for our center at NMUSC. We don't typically um, use these to monitor, but these are available. Okay, um, moving on to treatment in localized scleroderma. So this really runs the gamut from observation, so just observing and kind of mo clinically monitoring, um, of then to topical medications and then to systemic systemic medications. And honestly, treatment varies a lot by subspecialty. So, you know, as rheumatologists, we do not see all children with morphia. A lot of these children are seen by the dermatologist because, of course, it might present as a skin lesion first. Where do you go? You go to the dermatologist. Um, so the dermatologists are much more likely to use topical agents, so corticosteroids, steroid creams, um, another one, a vitamin D cream called Dovinex and then they also use light therapy. Um, as rheumatologists, we sometimes see the, I guess the more severe cases when the dermatologists think that these children require systemic medications. Uh, so we tend to, and we tend to use systemic um, medications called immunosuppressant medications. Um, these are indicated for moderate to severe disease. But really, this includes most patients except for those with sort of very superficial circumscribed plaque morphia. So, you know, any, any child that has a limb involved, arm, leg, face involvement, um, really all of those uh, children are, are going to need immunosuppressants, um, systemic treatment that is indicated for those patients. 
Okay, so when, so when to use systemic treatment. So when there's a significant risk for disability, um, that would be in uh, pansclerotic morphia, uh, also with linear scleroderma crossing a joint line. Um, so you can see in this young child here, the right leg is affected, it crosses the knee joint. You can get a contracture, a flexion contracture where the knee will actually um, get stuck in the bent position. Um, and then same here with the hand, um, right here. And then when the face is affected, such as in Ankou de Sabra, as you can see in this um, young boy right there, and then in more generalized morphia. Okay, so how to use systemic treatment. So this is the easy part. Methotrexate is the drug of choice. And then it gets complicated. Okay, so they did a poll of rheumatologists in the United States and Canada to see how they were treating their patients with morphia. And this is what they got at the top, quite the rainbow. So everyone was doing their own thing because again, with such a rare, rare disease, there's not a lot of um, guidelines as far as how to, uh, how to use these treatments. Well, so while we know methotrexate is the drug to use, how to use it is a different story. So they got a group of rheumatologists together and came up with what we call a consensus treatment plan. Again, we don't really, it's, it's much harder to do clinical trials in, pedi in the pediatric setting um, because it, it sort of, you know, adults can consent to be in a clinical trial and it gets kind of a little bit um, iffy with kids. And so oftentimes in the pediatric world, instead of clinical trials, they will do what we call consensus treatment plans. So that's basically where they lock a bunch of rheumatologists in a room and say, agree on something before we let you out. So, um, so that's what they did. And you can see they um, agreed to one single do uh, one dosing mechanism of methotrexate. Okay, so we went from this entire color wheel to everybody got on the same page with methotrexate. They got to sort of three different options for steroids, which is actually really good uh, because no rheumatologist, no one rheumatologist will taper steroids the same as the other. It's very different uh, among rheumatologists. So the fact that they got down to three is actually pretty good. And so here are the different uh, consensus uh, treatment plans. So you have a, B, and C, uh, and of course, this is depends, you know, on it's up to the discretion and judgment of the physician, as well as, um, you know, of course, they take every child into consideration. Every case, um, they weigh differently which plan uh, might be best suited for them. So, Plan A is actually just methotrexate, um, and B plan consensus plan B is methotrexate with IV steroids, and then plan C is methotrexate with oral steroids. Um, and so that is the way we treat this with medicines, but we shouldn't forget about the non-pharmacologic measures for um, that sort of uh, are an adjunct to the medicines as far as treatments go. So physical therapy is very important um, for muscle strengthening, rain, maintaining range of motion when joints are affected, and really with a focus on um, maintaining functional ability. Um, occupational therapy should be involved if, um, if, scler if the morphia or localized scleroderma is affecting the hand. Um, Botulinum toxin injections or Botox can be helpful um, for tightened muscles uh, affected by this, as well as uh, for um, it, with Ankou de Sabra when the face is affected and it can uh, sort of smooth out um, any sort of defects. Uh, left by the, the morphia on the face. And then surgery uh, can be used to correct sort of some atrophy and other deformities. And they can do things like autologous, like fat transfer, so taking fat from another place in the body and injecting it um, to sort of as filler to fill out. So you can see um, here pre-surgery, um, the Ankou de Sabra affecting the face here and a lot of asymmetry. And then here she has a pretty good cosmetic result um, and just m minimal asymmetry. Most people probably wouldn't even notice that. The important thing is that um, the surgery should be performed once the disease is in at, no longer active and once the child's growth is complete. 
And the one thing I did want to uh, just uh, hit on before, before changing topics to the systemic sclerosis is that patients who with facial or head lesions uh, are at risk for um, developing eye involvement, the uveitis that I mentioned earlier. So these patients should have routine eye exams. So this is something that shouldn't be forgotten about. Um, and because eye involvement can be asymptomatic. So they, your child may not complain about eye redness, eye pain, blurry vision. Um, so they should undergo routine screening. Okay, so now we're gonna switch gears a little bit to talk about um, systemic sclerosis. So this is a connective tissue disease of unknown etiology. This is characterized by skin and internal organ involvement. Um, so slightly different than the localized scleroderma that we were talking about. And the clinical manifestations that we see are the result of really sort of three different things going on in the body. So fibrosis or thickening, vascular injury, so problem with blood vessels, and then uh, autoimmunity. So to further classify systemic sclerosis, we break it into, um, into different subtypes. The diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis, limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis and overlap syndromes. And as you can see in this depiction here, so the purple is the affected skin. So with diffuse cutaneous, you expect more skin involvement, whereas limited cutaneous is really just limited to sort of elbows and knees down and the face. This again is um, sort of much rarer in the pediatric population. But again, this is, um, uh, based on the extent of skin involvement typically. And it's important to note the differences here because it's associated, the, these different subtypes are associated with different complications. Um, so just as sort of a brief overview, the diffuse cutaneous uh, subtype has again the widespread, often rapid skin thickening that occurs and it can be associated with lung disease, interstitial lung disease or ILD. The limited cutaneous uh, subtype has, again, the limited, uh, the skin thickening limited to the distal extremities and the, and the face, um, and can be associated with pulmonary arterial hypertension, or PAH. Again, this is the one that is, is typically rare in, um, in pediatrics. And then overlap syndromes. So really, these patients who have overlap syndromes, they can have any kind of skin involvement, whether it be limited or diffuse, and it can be associated with other um, connective tissue diseases or rheumatologic diseases such as dermatomyositis and lupus. Okay, so again, much like uh, localized scleroderma, systemic scleroderma or systemic sclerosis is a clinical diagnosis. So this is based on our physical exam findings. Um, and it's established by the presence of the typical skin findings, but not confined to one area and also plus or minus any internal organ involvement. Again, skin biopsy can be useful for confirmation if the diagnosis is in question, but the diagnosis is not dependent on lab testing or blood work. Um, so your sort of initial screening in, um, in children with systemic sclerosis, so routine blood tests are typically not helpful in making the diagnosis. Again, this is a clinical diagnosis made in the office based on exam findings, but the presence of these certain autoantibodies can be supportive of the diagnosis. Um, so again, the ANA or anti-nuclear antibody, and then oftentimes we'll run um, something called an extra, extractable nuclear antigen or ENA panel. Um, so these might be done when your child first presents with um, a concern for systemic sclerosis. I would also uh, mention consider checking additional labs if you suspect an overlap syndrome. Um, so muscle enzymes, if, you're, if your child is having um, muscle weakness or muscle pain, um, and then if there's any concern for lupus, they should also be looking, checking lupus labs. So um, how to interpret the labs? So again, um, an ANA will be positive in, um, in the majority of, uh, of cases, and it's typically a, a high titer, so not just a little bit positive, but pretty elevated. Um, and, a, and one out of five children with uh, systemic sclerosis will only have a positive ANA. They won't have any other 
sort of specific, um, what we call scleroderma specific autoantibodies. And so scleroderma specific autoantibodies that should be looked, uh, looked for are the antitopo isomerase or SCL70. Um, this is seen in 20 to 30 percent of, uh, of children with systemic sclerosis. It's associated with the diffuse cutaneous form of the disease and uh, people with SCL70 have increased risk for interstitial lung disease. The anti-centromere antibody is, um, uh, is found in only seven to eight percent of uh, children with systemic sclerosis, and that's associated with the limited form of the disease, and those uh, patients have an increased risk for pulmonary hi arterial hypertension, so you can see uh, much less common in, in the pediatric populations. And then you have two other, anti other antibodies, this anti-U1 RNP, and a PMSCL, which stands for polymyositis scleroderma, and those two antibodies are often associated with overlap syndromes. Okay, um, so initial evaluation in systemic sclerosis. Your child should have a chest X-ray. Um, your child should have pulmonary function tests if they're able to perform them. Um, I've got a video, hopefully it will work, um, but it will show you the coordination and sort of um, higher level uh, skills that it takes to be able to perform these tests. So younger children oftentimes aren't able to um, complete PFTs at least at first. Um, and the pulmonary function tests should include three different things. They should include spirometry, total lung capacity, and something called DLCO, which is uh, diff <coughs> diffusing capacity. Um, initial evaluation should also include an echocardiogram. So your child should have an echocardiogram. And so, um, so an echocardiogram should also be in the, as the initial evaluation, um, specifically looking at the ejection fraction and also something called the right ventricular systolic pressure or RVSP, which looks at the function of the right side of the heart. Okay. All right. Let's see if it'll work. You ready? There you go, nose clips. Easy breathing. One more breath. Get ready. Big breath. Blow fast. Keep going, keep going. Squeeze it out. Keep going, keep pushing. Three, two, one. Big breath in. Good job. Catch your breath. So not as easy as it looks. <laughs> um, so this is one of our patients. Um, this is my model for uh, PFTs. I think she was nine when she was diagnosed. And I believe she's 11 in that picture um, she, doing, doing the pulmonary function test. So she was a very good sport to let us use uh, that video of her. I told her she was gonna be famous. So. <laughs> um, okay, so the way this is, and I, you know, again, this is how it prints out for us when we do the, the pulmonary function tests um, at, our, at our institution at MUSC. Um, so there are a lot of numbers on there. So I've highlighted the numbers that I look at. Um, so um, the rest of them I leave to the pulmonologist. So the first two numbers here, you have your FVC at the top, which is the amount of air that measures the amount of air that, that your child can blow out and then right underneath that is the FEV1, which is the percentage of that that is in the first second, okay? So that's when they're yelling at her, blow hard, blow hard, blow hard, they're me that's what they're measuring. And we like these, this is, a, this is a set of normal PFTs for reference. We like those numbers to be around and above 80%, in this patient's they are. Um, the next one highlighted here is your TLC, or your total lung capacity, so how much air your lungs can hold. Again, we like that number to be around 80%. And then lastly, um, the diffusing capacity or the DLCO, um, and we like that number to be around 70% or above. Okay, so what if they aren't? Okay, what if, you know, there are lots of reasons, again, technique can be reason for uh, the, the PFTs to be abnormal. Again, they are very hard to do. I have adults that struggle with, with completing PFTs. Um, but if they are abnormal, um, so again, those are the numbers that we're looking at. So you can see the spirometry is below 80%. 
the lung volumes below 80 percent the diffusing capacity below 70 percent so these are abnormal so what now if the pfts are abnormal your child should get a high resolution CAT scan or CT of their chest. So a CT scan of the chest to look for evidence of interstitial lung disease. Okay. Um, if they, and so switching gears a little bit and talking about now the echocardiogram, which is again, part of the initial, um, initial screening or initial workup when this diagnosis is first made. Um, if the, remember what we said, the RVSP, the right, right ventricular systolic pressure, which is a measure of the right side, of the function of the right side of the heart, if that is abnormal, um, should consider doing a, um, a right heart catheterization, okay? That would be looking for evidence of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Again, this is associated with a limited form of the disease that's just much less common in kids. Um, an abnormal diffusing capacity on the PFTs uh, when the rest of the PFTs are normal should certainly raise suspicion for PAH. Um, and it might be worth just getting, repeating the PFTs and seeing if that's consistent uh, before pursuing a right heart catheterization because of course this is much more invasive than doing simple PFTs, breathing tests, or the echocardiogram, which is not invasive. And of course that's why we use it as a screening tool. Um, so if there's a decreased ejection fraction, that would be really the other main thing to look for on the um, on the echocardiogram. So if there's a decreased ejection fraction, which all that means is sort of the squeeze of the heart, if that is low, that should raise suspicion for myocardial fibrosis or thickening of the heart muscle. Uh, and that should um, prompt consideration for obtaining something called a cardiac MRI to look for myocardial fibrosis. Okay, so I'm just gonna go over now some of the more common clinical manifestations and we're gonna go sort of one by one and I'm going to uh, talk about the m kind of the most, uh, the most um, common treatments for these as well. So um, the common clinical manifestations, so Raynaud phenomenon and uh, then certainly skin disease uh, GI manifestation, gastrointestinal, both upper GI tract, so reflux, uh, and lower GI tract can be involved also, constipation, diarrhea. Um, scleroderma associated interstitial lung disease, or ILD as you'll hear me call it. Musculoskeletal manifestations such as myositis, which is inflammation of the muscles, or arthritis, which is inflammation or swelling of the joints. Cardiac manifestations like myocardial fibrosis and pulmonary arterial hypertension. And lastly, scleroderma renal crisis. We'll just touch on this briefly. It's extremely rare in children, um, but probably worth at least uh, mentioning. And the, this is sort of the important thing to, the important point to take into this as, as, we, um, as we delve into the treatments. So the treatment in scleroderma is not a one size fits all. It is very dependent on the organ involvement and not all patients with uh, systemic sclerosis require immunosuppressing medicines. Um, so, you know, I may talk about some of these manifestations and you say, oh, my, my child doesn't have that. Um, but, um, you know, it just, scleroderma is such a different disease. It affects people so differently. There's really almost no two patients that are the same. Um, and that should be kept in mind when deciding on treatment. Um, so I started with Raynaud phenomenon, which because it's the one of the most common presenting features um, of the disease, and it's the what, what we call a vasospastic response typically to cold, sometimes um, when people get nervous, that can trigger it also, but basically um, you get cold and your blood vessels clamp down uh, which cuts off the blood flow to the fingers. So they initially turn white, then they become cyanotic, okay? So the oxygen sort of runs out, they turn blue, uh, and then those blood vessels reopen and the blood rushes back and they turn red. So that's what we call the triphasic color change. Um, and you know this is important because number one, it can be painful or uncomfortable for people. And then also when you kind of have these repeated Raynaud's attacks where you're constantly cutting off the blood flow to the tips of the fingers 
multiple times a day, when you cut off the oxygen and blood supply to tissue, it dies. And so it can actually lead to digital ulcers or digital pits on the fingertips, which you can see here. Okay, so general things, general measures, um, certainly avoiding cold exposure. Uh, depending on where you live, that can be easier said than done. Um, but gloves at school, I, I tend to, to find that they freeze kids out at school. So just writing a simple letter, please let so-and-so wear gloves at school. Now, if they're teenagers, they don't wanna look different, they might not wear them, but you can at least encourage them to, to try to keep um, to try to keep their hands warm because of course we all think about cold when it's cold outside we don't think about cold when we're inside um, but certainly you know at what we would consider room temperature kids and people with Raynaud phenomenon are getting hardly any blood flow to their fingertips um, koozies for drinks koozies are your friends um, they should never pick up a cold beverage without a koozie on it um, and keeping your core warm is also really important because if you don't have good blood flow here, you're not gonna have it here. Um, so carrying a fleece, um, a hoodie, a blanket, socks, you know, when they go to the movie theater or church or something like that are all, um, are all important things. Um, oftentimes that is not enough in our patients. So the sort of first uh, line of medicines that we go to are the calcium channel blockers, um, amlodipine or Norvasc, and nifedipine or Procardia. Um, you can also use uh, topical nitroglycerin. Um, that works to dilate blood vessels, and you have the children or people apply it sort of to the web spaces of their fingers. This is honestly easier for adults to use. You know, kids are busy, they don't have time for this. Um, you know, you don't wanna get it on other people and things like that, so, um, so that can be a, a tough one um, in kids. Um, and then the, the next sort of the, really the second line medication wise are what we call the PDE5 inhibitors, sildenafil and tadalafil, which you may know by other names. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I've had definitely a few strange looks from parents. You're gonna put my kid on what? <laughs> Um, but the way these medications work, so Viagra and Cialis, the way that they work, they work by dilating blood vessels. So that works for Raynaud phenomenon. And I will tend to go to these uh, fairly quickly um, when children have um, digital ulcers. Um, and now that uh, Viagra has gone generic, it's actually a lot easier to get because these aren't approved for insurance. So. Um, and then, so moving from Raynaud's onto skin disease. Um, so again, this is another common symptom that brings children to medical attention. So initially the skin might appear edematous or swollen or puffy fingers, as you can see on the top. Um, and over time, the skin kind of begins to look sort of shiny and tight. Um, and underlying structures can be affected too. So you can get contractures of the fingers and then um, the tendons can be affected. You can get tendon friction rubs as well. Uh, and then other cutaneous findings um, that I included here are calcinosis and telangiectasias. So this is a picture of calcinosis. This is one of my patients. This is her thumb. So you can see it's kind of like that. Um, and that is a calcium deposit right there where you see white. Um, and then telangiectasias are sort of little red dots um, that look almost a little bit like broken blood vessels. They can appear on the palms um, and on the face and even on the lips or in the, um, in the mouth. Um, so the skin disease does not always require treatment. It really depends on, you know, how bothersome it is to the child um, as well as the extent of it um, as well. And so the treatment options here really include uh, mycophenolate mofetil, which you're, you'll hear me refer to as Cellcept, methotrexate um, if there's no lung involvement. So if I use methotrexate, I, I make absolutely certain that there is no lung involvement uh, because methotrexate can sometimes cause um, uh, an allergic reaction that can affect the lungs. And so I wanna make sure um, that I don't, um, that my patients don't have any lung involvement if that's what I'm going for. Um, and then also a medication called IVIG. Um, 
if you can get it. Um, okay, so that one is it's not approved for scleroderma. It's used in dermatomyositis or myositis muscle disease. Um, so we can't really get it unless usually our patients have an overlap syndrome. So again, another reason to have them check muscle enzymes because IVIG is very good at you know improving the tightness of the skin, um, but it's not uh, it's not approved for scleroderma itself. If you have elevated muscle enzymes, you can say, oh, they have an overlap syndrome and it is approved for the dermatomyositis, so you can get it that way. And this is a medication that nobody can afford um, uh, out of pocket. It's over $10,000 a month. So, um, so gastrointestinal manifestations or uh, GI symptoms. So after the skin, this is the most common organ um, affected and it can really be seen in up to 90% of patients. So first of all, I'll focus on the upper GI tract. Um, and what you can see here, so this is a CT scan, disregard the lungs, but I want you to focus here. So this large structure here is actually the esophagus. You're not even supposed to see the esophagus on a CT scan, but scleroderma, you get thickening, just how you get thickening of the skin, you get thickening in the esophagus and the esophagus stops behaving like it should. It doesn't normally, it doesn't have the normal peristalsis that sort of moves the food down as it should. It just sort of gets floppy and dilated and just sits there and doesn't do anything. So when it sits there, the food comes right back up. Um, so you get GERD or acid reflux. Um, over time, if this isn't addressed, it can lead to erosions or ulcerations in the lower part of the esophagus, as well as strictures or tightening, um, uh, where sometimes they'll even have to go in in some patients and actually dilate or stretch the esophagus back out. So you, of course, you want to prevent it, you know, prevent those from happening by being aware of it. Um, and I will definitely say that of all the things I'm gonna talk about, the GERD or acid reflux is a really hard thing for kids to describe. Um, it's not an easy thing for adults to describe, but younger children really have a hard time, even up until like early preteens, really have a hard time sort of uh, vocalizing if they are having reflux. So I have a pretty low suspicion. You know, if, if little kids, parents come in and tell me, they say their lungs are burning or their stomach is hurting and they're pointing right here, low suspicion for starting a medicine for reflux. Um, so then moving down to the lower GI tract, um, you're sort of, you know, you can have opposite ends of the spectrum. You can have diarrhea, which leads to malabsorption. So when you don't absorb your food properly, um, on the flip side, you can have constipation, which can lead to something called pseudo obstruction, which is almost like an obstructed bowel. Um, so I had patients with that as well. Okay, so treatment um, for acid reflux or GERD is really your proton pump inhibitors like Nexium, Protonix, things like that. Um, your H2 blockers like Zantac, Pepsid, Ranitidine, and then lifestyle modifications. So something as simple as sort of elevating the head of the bed to about 30 degrees. You just put some bricks or two by fours under the head of the bed, that can be helpful making sure that kids are not eating late at night, they're eating small meals, um, and not lying down within about an, you know, waiting more than an hour to lie down after they eat. Um, for malabsorption or diarrhea, problems with diarrhea, you can try rotating antibiotics, um, and then uh, another one that we sometimes try is called, uh, an antibiotic called rifaximin, and you may actually have seen commercials on TV for this one that's been recently approved for um, IBS with diarrhea, so that's another one. And then um, pseudo obstruction, so when these kids get severe constipation, they can often even get hospitalized for it because initially people are concerned that they could have a bowel obstruction. Um, and you can use uh, uh, a, a medicine called erythromycin that sort of is a motility uh, agent that helps things move through. And another one, uh, if erythromycin doesn't work, is octreotide. The downside of octreotide is that it's actually an injection that they have to do every day. So um, not pleasant for anyone, especially kids. Um, okay, um, next we will talk about uh, SSCILD or scleroderma associated lung disease. And this really accounts for a significant amount of uh, morbidity and mortality in our patients. So, you know, I, I, I take this very seriously. Um, and it often has a really uh, insidious onset. You know, you, it, it may not really declare itself, so you have to be on the lookout for it. Um, 
And as I said earlier, I can't stress enough, abnormal pulmonary function tests, abnormal PFTs should prompt a high resolution CT scan of the chest. So this is um, one of our patients and you can see, I'd like you to note the date here. So June of 2014, and here we're looking at a, a high resolution CT scan of her lungs um, and air appears black on a CT scan. So what you can see here at the bases of the lungs, you can see this sort of white, sort of fluffy, um, changes going on down here, that is interstitial lung disease. And for as far as the treatment of uh, interstitial lung disease, that's going to be Cellcept. Okay, that is the drug of choice. And in, here's this patient, here's a graph of her pulmonary function test. So here, so this was when the CT was taken um, in June of 2014, and you can see her numbers were 69%. We started the Cellcept, and you can see that the numbers have climbed. She's responded beautifully to treatment. And this is her repeat um, CT scan of her chest two years later, so June of 2016. And look here, you don't see those white changes anymore. So those have even healed. Um, so she's had an excellent response to the drug. Um, for the musculoskeletal manifestation, so these are really more common in pediatric scleroderma than they are in adult scleroderma. Um, so you can get uh, an inflammatory arthritis um, that can occur in up to a third of patients and um, myositis, which is muscle inflammation with weakness and elevated muscle enzymes, which are your CK and your aldolase. So as far as the treatment for these, um, a good, a very good treatment for arthritis and what we actually use to treat arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile arthritis is methotrexate. Again, in scleroderma patients, you want to make sure they don't have lung involvement before you're going to use methotrexate. Um, another one is tocilizumab or Actemra. Um, it's approved for the treatment of adult uh, rheumatoid arthritis and actually has gotten a fast track approval by the FDA to be studied in scleroderma. Um, and then, so your TNF inhibitors, the ones you see on TV, Embrel, Humira, there's a question mark about whether to avoid these in patients with scleroderma. It's theoretical at best. Um, so I will just leave it at that and say that they've even looked at these, looked at TNF inhibitors in the treatment of scleroderma. So it's definitely uh, uh, not, not a clear uh, picture at this point. Um, for myositis, um, I, I like Cellcept. I also like methotrexate. Again, you're going to hear me repeat this a lot. If there's no lung involvement, um, Imuran is another good one. Um, and again, IVIG. And like I said before, I will often, if there's any hint of an overlap syndrome, um, I will oftentimes try to get IVIG just because it is very good for the muscles, but also for the skin. Um, cardiac manifestations. These these are hard. Um, it's very rare. Myocardial fibrosis is very rare, uh, but it does represent a major cause of mortality um, in uh, children with scleroderma. Um, you can see arrhythmias, so problems with the, the electrical activity of the heart, um, and then cardiomyopathy, which is, uh, which is problems with the, the actual muscle and the squeeze of the heart. Uh, if you suspect it, you should consider that your doc, child's doctor should consider getting a cardiac MRI uh, to look for this further. And then scleroderma associated pulmonary arterial hypertension or PAH. Um, again, this is not common in children or less common in children. It's associated with the limited form of the disease. And uh, you, your doctor should pursue a right heart cath if the right ventricular systolic pressure on that echocardiogram is above 40. Um, so for the treatment of cardiac manifestation, so myocardial fibrosis, there's really no sort of standard of treatment, but again, because it is so rare, certainly immunosuppressive medications are indicated, but, um, you know, as far as which one works better than the other, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's almost, ca you know, a case report because, um, uh, it is such a rare complication. Um, for, the, um, for the pulmonary arterial hypertension, again, the PDE5 inhibitors, which are your Cialis and your Viagra, um, they're endothelian, recep endothelian receptor antagonists and prostacyclins. And the fact that there are this many uh, drugs now to treat PAH is actually a great thing. Um, you know, just, just even 10 years ago, these didn't 
really exist. Um, so we have much more treatments now than we used to. Um, and then just very br briefly, um, I will mention scleroderma renal crisis. It is exceedingly rare in children. I think, think there's something like maybe six cases in the literature or six cases that have been reported is extremely rare, um, but it, uh, it presents with high blood pressures and can lead to kidney failure. So it's, it's something to be, um, you know, it's something to certainly be aware of. And things that should make you maybe more concerned for de the development of scleroderma renal crisis is rapidly progressive skin involvement tendon friction rubs. Um, so that's basically sometimes the tendons, you'll even feel them, like they squeak, they go er, 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 like that, and it can be shoulders, it can be knees, ankles. Um, sometimes I've even had patients say like, oh, I, went, I have a top locker and I squeak when I put my books in my locker. You know, so tendon friction rubs, that should be something that the doctor picks up on exam. Um, and then another scleroderma um, specific antibody that I didn't even mention earlier because it's, it's so rare in children, but it's an RNA polymerase three. Um, and I do have uh, at least two young children that have this. Um, and, um, and then sort of lastly, to, and the reason that I wanted to mention scleroderma renal crisis is oftentimes people don't know a lot about rheumatologic diseases and they think, oh, we just treat these with steroids. So they sort of throw high doses of steroids, prednisone. Um, that is okay for other diseases like lupus and um, JIA or juvenile arthritis not always the answer in scleroderma and can actually sometimes cause harm because higher doses of prednisone and steroids can sometimes precipitate a scleroderma renal crisis. So I do always kind of caution my parents, if you go to uh, your local ER, you know, they're very steroid happy, and, but I just caution, you know, don't always, you know, if they, if they are offering high dose steroids, you might, don't, don't take them, call me first. Um, and so for the treatment of scleroderma renal crisis, the most important thing is to try to prevent it if possible. But um, if, if it does occur or if there is uh, suspicion for it, um, ACE inhibitors, which are a type of blood pressure medicine or the drug of choice, specifically one called Captopril, which is a pill um, that uh, it has a very short half-life, so it acts pretty quickly. And so you can sort of titrate it and go up on the dose quickly and monitor response. So it acts very quickly. So that's why that is typically the treatment for scleroderma renal crisis. Um, so for long-term monitoring, all children with systemic sclerosis should have an echocardiogram and PFTs if they're able to perform them every year, regardless of lung or heart involvement. Um, and m kids, some kids, if they have lung disease or interstitial lung disease, they may require PFTs even more frequently um, early on, early in the course of the disease. Um, so at a minimum, your child should be getting these every year. So the prognosis for pediatric scleroderma is, is much more favorable um, than um, adult scleroderma. So there's typically a lower frequency of severe organ involvement and the 10 year survival rate is 98%. So uh, that's compared to 75% in adults. So that is um, certainly something, uh, uh, something to champion there. Okay, so my parting thoughts, please Google at your own risk. Okay, these are th links to three different trusted websites. Okay, um, so the, the ACR website or rheumatology.org um, and that's for, the top one is for localized scleroderma or morphia. Um, they do not have one for systemic scleroderma for kids, so I did give you the link to the adult, uh, the, the adult um, uh, page on scleroderma and then of course the scleroderma foundation scleroderma.org um, and I would love to a lot of times say these to my patients but maybe you'll start feeling better if you stop reading WebMD I think is a good <laughs> takeaway um, so um, just want to thank you um, to uh, my patients and their families for teaching me so much about scleroderma and about how to care for um, patients and families um, of patients with scleroderma. And I want to thank my dad 
uh, who has been my mentor from an early age and to my family for their love and support and especially to my husband because uh, I stuck him with the kids so I could be here this weekend. <laughs> Thank you.